Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, depending on where you are in the world. As you can see, I am joined by Tim of Christian Concern. Uh, and today we're going to be doing a, 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 a general sort of discussion around the issue of um, whether Islam is intrinsically anti-Semitic. Now, we, we obviously know that there are Muslims who are anti-Semitic, just like there are Christians who are anti-Semitic, just like there are ethno-nationalists who are anti-Semitic. And so we're not discussing whether uh, particular believers have anti-Semitism. What we want to look at is whether the corpus of doctrine, values and worldview as imbibed in the Islamic text sources, that's the Quran, the Hadith, Tafsir, and other uh, sources of Sharia law, uh, which includes principles of feet, um, whether they um, could be accurately described as intrinsically anti-Semitic. And Tim is is going to be making a, 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 a well, we're going to be talking about it, and I'll, I'll let you um, kick off the conversation, Tim. But as we always do before we uh, do these kinds of talks, so let's start with a prayer. And uh, Tim, you've chosen a psalm. Do you want to read that all the way through as our opening prayer, and then we'll begin? Yeah. Psalm 13, um, one of my favorite psalms. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I'll sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I've overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. OK, Tim, do you want to kick us off then uh, on, on this question of whether Islam is anti-Semitic? Sure, let's do that. Right. So the question is, is Islam anti-Semitic? The question, as you said, is not about Muslims, whether they are anti-Semitic. It's about Islam. Islam should be judged according to its text, the Quran, the Hadith and the Sira or the biographies. I intend to demonstrate that Islam, as defined by its text, is anti-Semitic. So let's kick off with some quotations from the Quran. Surah 5 verse 51 says, O ye who believe, take not the Jews and Christians for your friends and protectors. We are but friends and protectors to each other, and he amongst you that turns to them for friendship is of them. Verily Allah guideth not a people unjust. Look at that then, clearly a very clear instruction, command even to Muslims, you are not to take Jews and Christians as your friends. Later on in the same Surah 564, it says this, I'm, I'm talking about the Jews again, we have cast among them animosity and hatred until the day of resurrection. Every time they kindle the fire of war against you, Allah extinguished it and they strive through the land, causing corruption, and Allah does not like corruptors. Notice it says there, animosity and hatred until the day of resurrection. That's right throughout time, including today. Animosity and hatred, that's anti-Semitic. Here's another one, 582. You will surely find the most intense of people in animosity towards the believers to be the Jews and those who associate others with Allah and the nearest infection to be those who say we're Christians and so on. The future sense there is important. You will surely find, it's not saying just today, it's saying in the future as well, the most intense people in animosity to be the Jews. Three times in the Quran, the Jews are cursed as apes and pigs or apes or pigs. Here's one of those examples from Surah 7, 166 to 167. So, talk about the Jews. When they were insolent about that which they had forbidden, we said to them, be apes, despised. I mentioned when your Lord declared that he would surely continue to send upon them until the day of resurrection, those who would afflict them with the worst torment. Notice again, it's saying until the day of resurrection, that people would be sent who would afflict them with the worst torment. That's talking about the Jews. That is clearly anti-Semitic. Then let's look at Surah 929. Fight against those who do not believe in Allah or in the last day who do not consider unlawful what Allah and his messenger have made unlawful and do not, do, do not adopt the religion of truth, that is Islam. From those who are given the scripture, which means Jews and Christians, fight until they give the jizya tax willingly while they are humbled. 
So it's fighting against, in particular, those who are given the scripture, which means Jews and Christians, and they are to fight until they pay the jizya, which is a subjugation tax for non-Muslims, and until they're humbled or humiliated in some translations. Clearly anti-Semitic again. Surah 60, verse 4, um, says this, we've denied you, talking about the Jews, and there has appeared between us and you animosity and hatred forever. Forever. Notice that. Forever. This carries on forever. I could quote many other verses from the Quran, but that will do for now. Looking into the Hadith, the most famous one is called the Apocalyptic Hadith that occurs in both Bukhari and Muslims. Collections of Hadith, it says this, Allah's Messenger said, which means Muhammad said, the hour will not be established until you fight with the Jews, and the stone behind which a Jew will be hiding will say, O oh Muslim, there's a Jew hiding behind me, so kill him. Clearly apocalyptic, clearly saying, uh, referencing Jews in particular, clearly anti-Semitic. This Hadith is cited in the Hamas Charter, Article 7, to justify Hamas's anti-Semitism. A 2011 poll found that 73% of Palestinians agreed with this Hadith. The Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Mufti Muhammad Hussein expressed his own agreement with this hadith in a sermon in 2012. Moving on to the Sirah, in the biography, Muhammad personally ordered the beheading of 600 plus Jewish men who had surrendered to him. That is religious genocide or ethnic cleansing um, in today's parlance. Muhammad also said, I will expel the Jews and Christians from the Arabian Peninsula and leave not any but Muslim. In another context, kill any Jew that falls into your power. He committed ethno-religious cleansing of the whole area where he lived. So in conclusion, I think we can all agree that this material is Islamic and it's anti-Semitic, comes from the weird texts of Islam. Therefore, I submit to you that Islam is anti-Semitic. I mean, I, 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 think, I think there's a very clear case there that um, certainly um, Islam is, has an anti-Semitic narrative that can be tapped into. Um, so for instance, like the, the, the kind of the kind of defenses that, that Muslims will give will will try to put it in its its context and, and that well in its context. They'll try to say that, you know, um the, the Jew the Jews betrayed Muhammad. They had treaties with Muhammad. Uh, and these treaties were of of non-aggression. Um, and packs of solidarity uh, in you know and so when when Muslims um, so so when the Jews betrayed Muhammad Muhammad was justified in his actions but these were only for Muhammad's time they're not um, they're not values that that Muslims have to embody today um, they're just what Muhammad did at his time. So how, how, how would you reply to that? Um, I think there's a number of responses to that. But what, what is to say that Muhammad is meant to be the perfect example for all time? And the Quran is also, you know, the text from, from heaven revealed for all time as well. So, you know, relativizing it in that way is kind of the kind of thing that, you know, traditional Orthodox mainstream Islam would just not do. They would just say, this is the eternal Quran. What are you, well, who are you to say I know better than that? Who are you to say that only applies at that time or that particular way or this particular thing? Um, so, yeah, that's that's one, one point to make. The other point is that the texts I've cited are ones that say until the day of resurrection, forever, this kind of thing that cannot be relativized to just these particular Jews at that time. Um, this is saying Jews forever. And the apocalyptic Hadith in particular is is saying you know at the end times you know you'll end up yeah you know, you'll you'll be killing Jews and and stones will cry out kill a Jew because there's one hiding behind me, you know this is clearly anti-Semitic. It's not just saying these particular Jews at this particular time. It's saying all Jews and and there are various other verses saying they're cursed and so on as well. Um, so I think that's very very difficult to sustain. And on the question of a treaty, I mean you know there was the Charter of Medina, which um, is recorded in the Sirah. Um, which looks relatively sort of benign in terms of, oh, to the Jews, your religion, to Muslims, their religion, and so on. Um, but what did you have five years later? Um, according to Islamic sources, basically no Jews anywhere living in Medina ever again. You know, so, you know, this charter with the Jews that's meant to give them protection and agreement didn't work. And as to whether they actually violated the treaty, well, there were three tribes in Medina, uh, um, the Baina, uh, Kainuka was the first one that Muhammad expelled, and before anything else happened, he threatened them with breaching. Uh, he, he threatened them with, you know, have you not seen what happened to the Bena Qureshi, um, which was the um, tribe back in Mecca? 
Um, so he basically threatened them and provoked them and, and argued, with them, which he was not supposed to do according to that charter. So he broke that charter first. Um, in the other case, the Banu al-Nadir, who were also expelled, um, Muhammad said, oh, I had a dream and they were plotting to drop a rock on my head. I mean, that was, that was therefore, you violated the treaty because I had a dream. <laughs> yeah, that, a dream. that was the reason for expelling yes. that tribe, is because of a dream. Yes, I had a dream that you're plotting against me, therefore you're plotting against me, therefore I have the right to expel you um, and fight against you. So, you know, how you claim that they were the ones to do it? And the Bene Kareza, the last one, who were exterminated, I mean, they were accused of plotting again with the Meccans, but, you know, that's an accusation and I don't know if there's any actual evidence of that. Um, so, so yes, I you know, I think these claims are very difficult to sustain, even in their own merits at that time as well. I think I think one of the things that usually highlights well um, the, the sort of anti-Semitic nature of it is if you just reverse it. So, for instance, if the president... You know, name me a dictator that's alive at the moment, you know. Um, Putin. Um, okay, yeah. So if Putin decided, right, I've had a dream that Muslims are plotting against me, uh, that they're going to blow me up in my car, therefore all Muslims are now expelled from the Russian Federation. Right across the entire... <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah right across yeah. the entire Muslim world, everyone mm. would rightly be crying out Islamophobia. Yep. And yet Mohammed is doing what, for instance, the Burmese government has done to the Rohingya Muslims. Yep. Um, and yet when the Burmese government does it to the Rohingya Muslims, um, it's Islamophobic, it, it, it's prejudice. But when Mohammed does it to the Jews, it's not. And I don't see how, how they can sort of like get around that comparison. You know, they I, I I debate Muslims all the time and they'll point out to me things like the Spanish conquistadors and the the, the Spanish kings, uh, the Spanish monarchy that, that forced out the Moroscos from Spain after the liberation of Spain during the Reconquista. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they call that, they, they, you know, they describe it as a hateful act. They describe it as a terrible act, as an Islamophobic act. And yet. That's exactly what Muhammad has done to these Jewish tribes, and so yeah. when it is done to Muslims, it's Islam Islamophobia. But when Muhammad does it to Jewish it tribes, it's not anti-Semitism. Yeah. That's a very good point. Yeah, no, you're, you're exactly right. It's a very good way of illustrating it and explaining. And yeah, the attempts to justify this kind of thing, you know, by relativizing it or by trying to make excuses in terms of the what actually was happening in the history and so on, just don't work. I just don't think they work. Yeah. And, and and I I think that you, you know you've got this you've got this um this fact that in in the 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 Quran where it talks about fighting against the Jews and the Christians yeah. um until they paid the jizya. Yeah. Well uh, for me there's two issues there. Firstly you've got the fact that the the reason for the waging of the war isn't because you know the Jews or the Christians betrayed Muhammad it's because they are Jews or Christians. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and 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 if if it was No, you're right. There's no there's no reason given there other than they are people of the book, they are the people of the scripture, they are the people who don't believe me, yeah. basically, isn't it? Yeah, you you don't believe me, you don't accept me as a prophet. Um, and then, you know, you know, whereas Muhammad, you know, didn't fight when he was in Mecca and didn't have enough power to fight, when he got into Medina and gained more power and more people, um, he, you know, he turned to fighting and, and aggression. Yeah. Um, he did. He actually threatened aggression in, in Mecca and they were pretty shocked and appalled that he would do that. But he didn't carry it out there. Mm. Um, so, so, yes. And then you end up with these three options for Jews and Christians, um, which is convert, die, or accept um, dimmy status, subjugation status, where you pay this um, extortion subjugation tax, the Jizya tax, yeah. and um, and you have to wear distinctive clothing, and you can't build any new mosques or synagogues, and you can't, or any synagogues or churches rather, and um, you have to be in deference to any Muslim, you can't be in authority of any Muslim in any context, um, and your voice is not recognised in court, and so on and so on. You know, and it's basically like an apartheid system, really, yeah. against Jews and Christians. And again, I, and I that's what I... the historical record shows that that's what yeah. they actually did. 
Oh yes, absolutely, and 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 I, and I think again in terms of in terms of highlighting that, if you just ask Muslims, like, okay, let's imagine that because right now we've got the rise of right wing governments around Europe, right wing parties around Europe. If we imagine that an extreme right wing government managed to establish itself in the Netherlands, mm. that that stripped. Um, Muslim citizens of the Netherlands of half of all of their rights, mm -hmm. and 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 made them l legally less able to live out a, a full life than a, a non-Muslim. Would that Muslim call that government Islamophobic? Undoubtedly, oh, and I mean, undoubtedly of course yes. they would. Yeah, of course they would. You know, and again, the idea of kind of relativizing this, which I've seen some people do, and say. Oh, they have special protected status. You know, you couldn't attack the Jews and Christians. They had special protected status. Protection from what? Mm. From protection who? from what? It's, it's protection from being killed by Muslims. Yeah. Um, you know, on pain of not um of not converting. Um, you know, you you, you pay the GC tax, and very often in the traditions, you know, they would actually, you know, smack you on the neck, you know, and give you a, a thumb, but you had to kneel down and bow down and be smacked on the neck as a symbol of like if you hadn't paid this, you would be killed. And that, that's descriptions of how the jizya was collected in Spain, isn't it? Yes, and various other places, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and one of the other defences that I often hear around the jizya tax is that Muslims say, oh, well, you know, um, Christians pay the jizya tax and um, Muslims pay the zakat. And so, you know, it's just that you <laughs> well... pay the jizya and we pay the zakat. And so therefore, <laughs> you know, you're not being treated badly or any differently. So zakat is 5%, uh, isn't it? It's 2.5%. Um... Sorry, two point five percent. Yeah, um, and one of the five pillars of Islam, and um, and yeah, but jizya originally was like fifty percent of your income. It could go up to fifty percent, yeah. Um, and then it was other extortionate huge amounts, mm -hmm. and there are accounts of people paying this tax. And of course, you know, the wealthiest Jews could the wealthiest Jews could pay it, and you know, but they had to do this whole symbolic um, ritual of of handing it over and bowing down and being hit over the head and all this stuff. And then the poorest Jews couldn't pay it and no exceptions were given and no possibilities were given and they would just be brought along and if they couldn't pay it, they'd be killed. You know, and that's what happened. You know, And every mm. year they would do this, no exceptions ever allowed. The Quran is very, or the traditions are very explicit about that. You know, you cannot make any exceptions for Jizya, they must all pay it. And, um, and they did on pain of death, yeah. What 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 other sort of evidences can you bring forward to, you know, demonstrate that um, that Islam is intrinsically anti-Semitic? Well, I would go. I mean, there are other verses in in the Quran, lots of them. There are also other hadith, um, things like "Do not greet Jews and Christians." Um, um, Muhammad saying, "May Allah's curse be on Jews and Christians because they build places of worship at the graves of their prophets." Um, you've got no Muslim would die, but Allah would submit in his stead a Jew or a Christian in hellfire. Um, you, you've got um, all, all those kind of stuff. Um, and another hadith saying, um, you know, he heard some sound. He said that's the Jews being tormented in their graves. Um, another hadith saying the Antichrist or the Ajal will be followed by 70,000 Jews. Um, another hadith says Jews are mutated into rats. Jews cause meat to rot. You know, all this kind of stuff is is there. Um, and then you've got um, the, the most interesting one to me from the Quran, which yeah, is um, not obvious, but it's obvious when you look at how it's interpreted, is Surah 1-7, which is um, actually one that's recited uh, in the five daily prayers when they pray five times a day. Um, and Surah 1-7 um, talks about... Um, Guide us not on the straight path, the path of those who bestowed favor. God, sorry, guide us along the straight path, the path of those upon you who you say have bestowed favor, not on those who've earned your anger or those who've gone astray. And the traditional interpretation, which is related from um, Bukhari's collection of hadith, um, clearly says that those who earn your anger are the Jews and those who've gone astray are Christians. And you've got many other interpreters who agree that that's what it means there, many other theologians as well. And you, this gets preached in, in sermons. There's a sermon in, in New Connecticut in a mosque in November just last year. The imam said, 
Muslims recite this first chapter of the Quran 17 times a day in their five daily prayers in order to be reminded of Allah's anger towards the Jews. Um, in just last month in April, in a sermon in Fort Lauder Fort Lauderdale in Florida, uh, the Imam said, according to the Quran, who are those whom Allah is upset or angry with? The Jews, followed by the misguided ones who are the Christians. Um, and you know, it clearly says that's who we're praying about. That's what we're saying when we pray this prayer. We're being reminded every day about how um, Allah's wrath and anger rests on the Jews. I mean, so yeah, seventeen times a day they're reminding themselves of the wrath of Allah against the Jews. But but That's... I mean, I, I can you know if I sort of channel my inner inner Muslim, um, yeah. my inner Riza Aslan, I, I I would say that like. Well, you know, that's God being angry with the Jews or the Christians. That doesn't mean that Islam, i.e. the Muslims, are intrinsically, and doesn't mean Muslims are intrinsically anti-Semitic. No, it's just, it's just on, Allah that's being... That's hard to sustain, isn't it? Well, well go on then. I mean, tell us You're, what's wrong yeah, with that defense. We're praying. I can, you we're know... praying. Lead us on this path, not the path of those people who are the Jews who you're angry with, God. You know, you, you're just you're reminding yourself every day of how God is angry with the Jews. And it, that's, you know, that anger persists to this day. So it's anti-Semitic to put it in that way, isn't it? Well, I mean, I, you see, I I, I, I know that, that Christians do jump on this, but for me, it's not one of the strongest arguments, or, or at least we don't frame it very well. I think the way that we need to frame it in, in that sense is that yeah. because... Because the Christians and the Jews are identified as going in the wrong direction, upon whom, whom, um, whom, upon whom Allah's, anger rests. Allah's, Allah's anger rests. Yeah, you've got to connect it to the fact that Muslims are supposed to hate what Allah hates and love what Allah loves. Oh yeah, and yeah. and and we miss that link in the chain, mm -hmm. so that Muslims are to be angry for the sake of Allah, mm -hmm. uh, to love for the sake of Allah. They are mm -hmm. to, you know, to do everything for the sake of Allah. So that which that those upon whom Allah's anger rests, according to according to uh, Islamic belief, they need to, um, you know, embody that in some mm -hmm. way, that judgment in some way. Mm -hmm. And I think that we, you know, yeah. we, we, it needs to, there's a link in the chain of that argument that we need to make better to demonstrate Fair that point. point. No, fair point. Yes, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I'm thinking it's obvious. I mean, you know, because it's not you know, obvious. Being a Christian, being a Christian, I interpret it that way because you know, if God is pleased with this kind of people, then I should be pleased with this kind of people. God is angry with this, I should be angry with this as well, in the same kind of way. So, so yes, but perhaps it's not obvious to the observer, yeah, um, in the street, in in quite the same way. And I did say it's less obvious because it's it does the text itself in the Quran doesn't mention Jews. Mm. Um, there you have to go to the Hadith you have to go to the tafsir to, to make that, yeah, because the text that, itself, um, and, you, and you've it. got to be wary of the text. You've got to be wary of the text not saying that, because a slippery apologist will yeah. basically use the yeah. fact that the text doesn't say something explicit as a get out. Yeah. yeah. So you've yeah. really got to nail things like that down. Yeah, um, I'm sure. I, I would. I would. But go then on you and... see, you know, at the end of the day, Bob, you know, you're asking me what other arguments have I got, and I can also go to theologians and also, you know, lots of quotes from Islamic theologians or scholars, and and then you can go to history as well, and you have lots of quotes from um, examples of um, Islamic anti-Semitism through history. But at the end of the day, I don't actually have to prove very much to show that Islam. All I need to say is there are certain texts in the Quran, in the Hadith, in the Sirah. That are anti-Semitic, and that yeah. that is the bottom line, right? You know, you know, nothing, nothing else counts in a way. You know, yeah. if I lose the argument on history or lose the argument on theologians or whatever, it doesn't really matter. Although it'd be very surprising if all the theologians didn't agree with what the text said, you know, but they don't. But you know, or if all the historical evidence was that Muslims weren't anti-Semitic, but the, the evidence is they were, you know. Um, but it's the text at the end of the day, you know, that proves the point one way or another. Yeah. You know, and even if there are phallo Semitic texts in the Quran, that doesn't matter either because, you know, I'm not, I don't have to prove that every text of the Quran is anti-Semitic. I just have to prove that there are texts in the Quran or the, the Hadith or the Sirah that are anti-Semitic and that, um, that are not limited to the Jews at that particular time and all that stuff. Um, and then you've got it. There we are. We've proved that Islam yeah. is anti-Semitic. And I think it's important to remember that if someone tries to jump to the, if, you, if you're trying to make this point in an argument and someone tries to jump to 
the Bible um, to reverse the argument. You need to just focus in on 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 the question that you're discussing and not. Yeah, allow no, them to I agree. I mean, script. I think you know people will likely sort of say, "Well, if you're saying the Quran tells me the Bible is too," and you know, for the purposes of this question, you know, well, you know. Why are you bringing the Bible into it? Because the question is, is Islam anti-Semitic, right? So, you know, the Bible's got nothing to do with that. Um, yeah. You know, obviously, mm-hmm. one can very happily debate whether the Bible is anti-Semitic, and maybe we should do that another time, you know? And, you know, clearly, Jesus is Jewish Messiah, and it's all written by Jews, and all these other points. And there are many more points we can make about this. Um, and I think it's quite easy to prove that the Bible is not anti-Semitic. Um, you know, so you know, and again, that's what my case rests on. If I have to prove the Bible, I suppose you have to prove there are no fully anti-Semitic texts in the Bible, and I think that can be proven. Yeah, I do. Um, I do. I just want to. I just want to come back to a, a couple of the points that you made. I. Yep. It, it's ironic that Muhammad cursed the Jews and the Christians. And yeah. Have, what What was that one? Because they built their churches and synagogues on the tombs of the prophets. What? Yeah, that was a. That's a hadith. That one. Yeah. Yeah, have you got the reference? Have you got that yeah. one to quote? Yep. Um, here we go. The um, the um, here we go. Yes, yeah, Bukhari four fifty six six sixty. Yeah. May Allah's curse be on the Jews and the Christians, for they build places of worship the graves of their prophets, and by that he intended to warn the Muslim from what they Jews and Christians have done. Because what you've got there is that is telling you something about Muhammad's heart. Yeah. That isn't Allah speaking. Yeah. That is Muhammad making a prayer to Allah about yeah. the Jews and the Christians yeah. based upon Jewish and Christian practices. Yeah. Now, if I was to go, right, um, we should destroy all them, you know, make may God curse the Muslims because the Muslims um wear the burqa. Or God curse the Muslims because Muslims don't eat pork, mm. right? I would be identifying something intrinsically Islamic mm. and mm. then praying that mm. God curses them mm. because of, of the way that they're expressing their faith. Mm. Mm. And, mm. and that's telling you something about my heart mm. and about my mm. heart towards yeah, that's a good point. Muslim practices. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 for me, and the one, one of... about he heard he heard something and then said that's the Jews being tormented in their graves. That's similar, isn't it? You know, well, a Muslim he, would he... just say a Muslim would just say that you know that that that's exactly what he heard. He heard the Muslims being tormented ah. in their graves. <laughs> yes, of course. But, so so that's <laughs> for me. That's not a strong argument that because yeah. anything anything that is in terms of proving that that Islam is intrinsically anti-Semitic, right. Bearing in mind, to some degree, this is a very modernist kind of conversation. Anything that's intrinsically metaphysical in that discussion is going to be a weaker point than something that has real, practical, observable, this world application. Yeah, but it depends who you're arguing with, isn't it, Bob? Because, you know, if you argue someone who's not a Muslim, you know, I, you know, they would laugh at that idea as I just did, right? You know, if you argue with a Muslim, the, you know, then maybe they would actually make that point. Fair enough. I would probably still laugh at it, but... You know, it's yeah, the, and a non-Muslim listening to that would think, yeah, that's crazy. Well, I, I, I would, I, I would suggest, I would suggest that your strongest points are points that have real-world impact. So, for instance, you've got the yeah. verse in the Quran that talks about, um, don't take Jews and Christians as friends. Yeah. Right now, that that has a very direct application. Don't take Jews and Christians as friends. If I if you were to preach a sermon in a church and it was to be released on YouTube in which you said, don't take um, Muslims, Muslims as friends, yeah, people would be accusing you of Islamophobia. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So why is it yeah. not anti-Semitic or in this case, even Christophobic? When yeah. Muhammad yeah. says, don't take Jews and Christians as And, friends. you know, it's very interesting because this verse is not well known. You know, I remember some years ago, Bob, I had some um, Israelis come to my house um, and they they fought in the IDF, you know, as part of their national service, whatever. And I said, do you realise the Quran says, I can't remember how it came up, but it came up. Do you realise the Quran says, don't take Jews and Christians as your friends? They're like, no, don't be serious. It doesn't say that. 
So I had to go and get a copy of the Quran for them and show them. And they couldn't believe it was a genuine Quran, you know. <laughs> so yeah. They just, you know, they were astonished that the Quran says this. They had no idea. And I thought, my goodness, you've actually been in the IDF and you don't know this. What is going on? You know, they, surely everyone in the IDF knows that. No, it's because Israel is a, a liberal state. It, it, mm. it, it's a liberal state like the UK and America. And so a, a lot of people in the culture, just like in the UK, are just very unaware of a lot of the things that we're talking about. Mm. Me and you mm. are familiar with the material. Me and you mm. are familiar with the history. Me and you mm. are familiar mm. with the stories of the martyrs and the confessors. And mm. and and mm. but but for lots of people, the only thing that they've ever been told are Islamophilic statements from their politicians and celebrities. And yeah. their only knowledge of any sort of Quranic verses or verses like he who saves a single word life saves the world entire. You know, which is a which total is a misquote. Which, yeah, is, which is, is a misquote. Is it me misquoting? Is it the Quran misquoting? You're misquoting. It. Yeah, go, go on. Quote me properly. Do you remember? I can pull it up. I can find it. No, I I can no because it actually says um, we've ordained for the children of Israel. Yes. This is one interesting point. You know that um, whoever kills a soul, no, it's got this exception there. Whoever kills a soul, unless for um, um, murder or spreading mischief in the land. It yeah. would be as if he slowed the whole people, and, and if he saved a life, it would be if he saved the life of the whole people. Those words, by the way, are quotation from the Talmud. They're a Jewish tradition, um, which the Quran is just quoting there, and it's saying this is what was ordained for the Jews. And then the very next verse says the penalty uh, for those who wage war against Allah's messenger and strive upon the earth to cause corruption, which is the exception made in the previous verse. Remember, you know, you know whoever kills a person except for uh, spreading mischief in the land or corruption, um, the penalty for that is execution or crucifixion or cutting off of hands and feet on opposite sides or exile from the land. And that is their disgrace in the world and a heavy punishment is theirs in the hereafter. And so in that context, you've actually got a justification of execution. In the context where they misquote it and say the Quran says, if you kill someone, it's like you kill the whole world. Actually, the justification is there for execution or crucifixion of people who spread mischief in the land and mischief in the land from other contexts is basically disobeying Allah, which is anyone who's not ultimately following Muhammad. Well, yeah, um, it's, it, the Tasfiyas would describe us, me and you, as, as creating mischief in the land. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, and, because, and the Jews are critics of, of the people who spread mischief in the land. Because we're, well. critics, we're critics of, of Islam. Yes. You know? um, yeah. And, 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 you know, like the, the only saving graces for any Islamist that might watch this is we're not in uh, a land of a caliphate. And so we're not in Muslim land at the moment. We're in the land of uh, we're in the Dar al Hab or the um, the land of treaty, depending on which version of, of Sharia law you're following. Um, but but, but just to is, say that Surah 17 verse four, we convey to the children of Israel in scripture, that's the Jews, that you will surely cause corruption mm. on the earth twice and surely reach a degree of great, great haughtiness. The same word that's used in 533 there, that the punishment for corruption is, is execution, crucifixion, or cutting of hands and feet. So when you right. link those two together, you yeah. have a clear a, a clear legal justification in Sharia law. Yes. Persecution and oppression of Jews. Yes. As well as Christians. Yes. You know, and I, I, I just want to actually go back to the, 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 the point that Mohammed said about, you know, May Allah's curse be upon them because they build their churches and synagogues on the tombs of the prophets. Because the irony of irony is Muhammad's tomb in Medina is now a mosque. It's now a place where where, where <laughs> Muslims go to pray. So I, I just find that ironic that uh, his point. his own tomb has been turned into yeah. a into a mosque and the hadiths. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, th 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 there is a there is another point that you mentioned. You know, uh, there's a hadith that says if it wasn't for the Jews, that meat would rot. Could you quote that one for us? Yeah, you mentioned that one. Yeah. Um, so let's just um, find that one quickly. Um, um, so this is from Sahih Bukhari, four fifty five five four seven. Mm. But for the Israelis, meat would not decay, and but for Eve, wives would never betray their husbands. Uh, so again, blaming Jews for meat decaying and for wives ever betraying their husbands as well. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the the, the it, this tube there, you you got to be careful because Eve 
you know, like when when a Muslim reads their own text, they read it, they try to read it a bit like a lawyer, you know, yeah. and and yeah. they would go, well, no, that the Eve bit was not connected to the Jews. The Eve bit is about adultery in the world is because of Eve. Despite um, the fact that Islamic sources say that Allah is the one that um, gives you the amount. No, the text doesn't mention Eve, of course. I mean, the text just mentioned the Israelis. Oh, does it not mention Eve? I don't think it does. No. Uh, have you got the text? Um, yes. Um, Let's have a look at the text. No, you're right. I, and I, you're right. I've misread it. But for the Israelis, meat would not decay. And but for Eve, wives would not betray their husbands. You're right. So, so the, yes, I, no, yeah. it does mention Eve. You're quite right. But you've got um, you've you've got this 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 you know the fact yeah. you, you've got some interesting theological points that fall out of that. Firstly, it, it's a kind of nod; it, it 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 diminishes Muslims' complaint against the idea of original sin. This idea yes. that because no. one people, yeah, one group sinned, everyone suffers a consequence. Because so the reason yeah. apparently, according to that idea, hadith, the reason why the meat in our fridges rots is because of the Jews. Yeah, you know. Um, and that's, you know, uh, like, even if it were true, which it's a very laughable idea that it is true, yeah. but even if it were true, that would mm -hmm. mean that Muslims admit that the sins of one person or one group of people can affect the whole of creation. Yeah. You know, uh, so they have a similar concept to the fall there. Um, yeah. but, but. What what would you do if you know if a Muslim just turned around and said, look, you know, this had I don't believe this hadith, I don't believe that hadith. You know, if you threw these hadiths at them and they said, well, you know, when we we don't really believe, are these Sahih hadiths that you're reading, or are these daif, or what's the what's the grading of the hadiths? Well, they're Bukhari and sometimes Muslim, which are the highest you know respected hadith, um, particularly in the Sunni tradition. And the problem with not believing the hadith is. Where do you get the even the five pillars of Islam? You can't find them just in the Quran. Yeah. Right. So, you know, the hadith are absolutely core to Islamic teaching and, and, and tradition. And certainly for any orthodox, traditional, mainstream Muslim, they see the hadith as authentic, authoritative sayings of Muhammad. Authentic and authoritative. Um, and so, you, you know, mainstream, traditional Orthodox Muslims would not just say, I don't believe that. Now, some modern Muslims are trying to say that. They're trying to revise Islam and, and cut out bits they don't like. And I would sort of say, why do you say you don't believe that? Presumably because it is anti-Semitic. You know, you know, I mean, yeah, but then you've lost your point because this is an Islamic text, traditionally regarded as authentic and authoritative. And therefore, you know, Islam is anti-Semitic. And of course, you know, why does Hamas appeal to this hadith because it's authoritative because yeah hello uh, oh we seem to be having and they know that muslims will therefore that must be true and therefore i should you know believe accordingly and behave accordingly and think the same you know and so you know the authority is absolutely there and if you know, any particular muslim might say i don't believe these hadith you know fine in a sense good for you you know, but that is not what mainstream traditional Orthodox Islam teaches or believes or says. Yeah, I think one of one of the things that I I would draw out is the fact that you you know when if you read the could could you read the apocalyptic hadith? Yeah, um, let's just get up again. Just want to quote it exactly for you again. Um, so Allah's messenger said, the hour will not be established until you fight with the Jews and the stone behind which a Jew will be hiding will say, O oh Muslim, there is a joy hid Jew hiding behind me, so kill him. That is in Bukhari, uh, 452, 177, also 452, 176, and in Sahih Muslim, 41, 6985. Yeah. Now, we, we, we once, there was a time when the Mormon faith said that the Mormon faith is a, an American religion um, that mm -hmm. takes that looks tries to look like Christianity, but uh, there was there was a time in the Mormon faith where they said that um, black people couldn't join their priesthood, they right. couldn't they couldn't they couldn't become members. Um, now, that that no, no one would dispute that that is a racist ideology, or that you know the idea that. The Ku Klux Klan, for instance, believe that there's going to be a race war 
between white people and black people and they project it into the future they say and it's not now but it's coming and there's going to be a war between white people and black people yeah. or, or white people and, and people of other non-whites right yeah that is a, an essential um uh what's the word i'm looking for uh racist no 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 i'm talking about when something's in the future not existential. Apocalyptic. Apocalyptic. Ap apocalyptic. There's another word for it. Eschatological. Eschatological. There we go. That's an eschatological hope of the Ku Klux Klan, is that there's going to be a race war and there's going to be the triumph of the white race over other groups. How is this any different? They have an eschatological hope that there will be a war between Muslims and Jews. And any yeah, Muslim yeah. who believes this has to believe, has to be willing, has to be ready to be mm. that Muslim that when the rock falls out to them, they will come and kill the Jew. Well, that is, that is of course, how it is preached in sermons. You know, and the examples I gave to you, and there are many more as well. Um, you know, the imams preach it in a mosque and and use it to incite people to violence, in, in a sense, or to be anti-Semitic at the very least. And, of course, it, it was... Yeah, you know, the interesting thing is the Hamas Charter has some footnotes relative to this um, text as well. Mm. Um, let me just um, quickly bring that up a minute. Um, and, um, you know, so it, it says in the footnote um, that the Egyptian troops who launched the assault on Bar Levlan in October 73, that's the uh, Yom Kippur War, isn't it, or not? Uh, were equipped with booklets of guidance that included this same quotation. And uh, so, you know, it's very interesting because the footnote to the Hamas Charter sort of, you know, lends authority to it by saying this is the same hadith that the Egyptian troops uh, used and were given in it. Yeah. And then another footnote says, um, Bukhari and Muslim are the authors of the two most authoritative, widely accepted collections of hadith or traditions of the Prophet. So, you know, they, they are clear, they are very clear to explain this hadith is there um, because you know, it's authoritative and it's been used before and it's been used to help people who want to fight against, you know, and, and this is... The... To inspire and encourage. Yeah. And, you know, Hadith's um, own slogan is, is you know, includes things like jihad is our way and, you know, the Quran is our constitution and and dying in the, for the cause of Allah is the greatest thing and stuff. You know, they are yeah. full-on Islamists, aren't they? Um you know, and then that, this is this is part of their justification by going to the Quran and the and the Hadith to justify what, what, exactly what they think. Tim, why do why do you think it is important for us to point out to Western audiences that Islam is intrinsically anti-Semitic? What why 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 even bother with that? Why why is it even worth pointing that out? Aren't you actually just being Islamophobic by pointing that out? Like what what what's the, what why is it a valid thing to state? Well, um, I think it's important to assess the claims of religions and to assess what religions are teaching and to expose and, and explain what religions are teaching. I'm interested in the truth. I'm interested in, in sort of, you know, getting to which religion is true, which one is not true, and to, you know, showing what religions actually teach and what they actually espouse. And, you know, I think there's a massive contrast. I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm not a Muslim. I believe Christianity's Judaism is false. And one way to show how Islam is false is to show exactly what it teaches and to show exactly what it's like and to show what Muhammad is, is like and what Muhammad actually taught and how Muhammad actually behaved. And you know, actually, when you expose this stuff, you know, ultimately, my motivation is to cause Muslims to rethink their faith, particularly um, um, cultural Muslims or, you know, who haven't really thought about it. And you say, did you know this is what Islam is like? This is what it actually teaches, what Muhammad is like. And for quite a lot of Muslims, they don't know because they're not encouraged to read the Quran in their own language. They're not encouraged to um, ask questions and so on. In the same way that Christians do encourage Christians to read the Bible and ask questions in in, Muhammad, in Islamic culture, they don't. And then to say, you know, surely you should follow Jesus rather than Muhammad because, you know, Jesus rose from the dead, Muhammad didn't. Um, Jesus, um, for example, never handled a sword and Muhammad did. Jesus healed people and never hurt anyone. Muhammad never healed anyone but hurt people um, and and so on and say, you know, surely you should rather follow Jesus than Muhammad. And for a lot of people, they never thought about it in those terms. And it's very good to explain it and to show people 
that this is what Islam, as judged by its texts, again, you know, differentiate it from Muslims, many of whom do not know what the texts say, because they're cultural Muslims, or whatever. But you know, Islam itself is intrinsically anti-Semitic. And this, the other, the other side of this is that you can't understand the Arab Israeli conflict without understanding that Islamic texts and Islamic teaching motivates anti-Semitism amongst Muslims. And that's a very important, significant factor in the whole Arab-Israeli conflict. I think it, not just in the Arab-Israeli conflict, but also amongst the hate marches that we're seeing marching. Oh, yeah, no, the good point. Yeah, I mean, also in the West, yeah, as an overflow of the Arab-Israeli conflict, effectively, into the streets and universities of Western um, campuses and, and, and Western culture, because we have, you know, such a you know, significant portion of Muslims now in Western culture, we are seeing those same anti-Semitic sentiments expressed and a massive rise in Islamic, um, um, sorry, anti-Semitic attitudes and anti-Semitic expressions, particularly yeah. since the Hamas attacks on October the 7th. And this is not a coincidence. And, you know, my point is as well to say that anti-Semitism amongst Muslims is not just because of the arbit the arbitrary conflict, it predates the arbitrary conflict. Yes. It's more intrinsic to Islam than that. It goes all the way back to Muhammad and the Quran and the Hadith and all the way through Islamic history, to be quite frank. You know, and so the arbitrary conflict in that sense is not new, or anti-Semitism is not a new thing, just just came about in the 20th century, as you might be led to believe from the way the West portray it, you know, and oh almost excusing Islamic anti-Semitism as well, yeah, because of the Arab conflict or something like that. Well, no, it's much deeper than that. They go back to the Quran to justify it, and you can provide lots of examples of that as well. Exactly. I mean, Europe had its first anti uh, anti-Semitic pogrom in Paris just a few years back. Um, that that hardly made the news, though it should have. Um, you know, surely not the first pogrom ever in Europe. No, no, it no. wasn't the first pogrom in Europe, but it's the most recent since the Second World War. Right, you know, right. This was the right. most. It's the first time we've had an anti-Semitic pogrom in Western Europe since the Nazis, and yeah. it was a Muslim major. It was a, a Muslim anti-Semitic pogrom um, that attacked, like the pogrom, the anti-Christian pogroms that are happening in Egypt at the moment mm -hmm. and happening mm -hmm. in Pakistan right now. Um, mm. like mm. You, you, you've got these things and it's like the liberal establishment just can't join up the dots, you know. Well, they don't want to. I mean, I think, yeah. you know, it's an uncomfortable truth, isn't it? Um, um, that even even Jews don't seem to want to recognise that Islam is anti-Semitic. Um, some of them do, of course, you know. Um, but, yeah, the, the Western culture, yeah, we don't want to believe that there is an ideology that Islam is anything other than a peaceful, loving religion because that's what we believe all religions are like because Christianity is the only religion we have any real understanding of. I mean, I, you know, I remember when I worked in the city, um, Bob, with very highly educated, you know, Oxbridge educated people. And, you know, I said Muhammad is a warmonger and led lots of wars. They just didn't believe me. They just didn't believe me. I, they, you, know, that, you, know, you know, what are you talking about, you know? That you know, he's a religious leader. Religious leaders are peaceful. You know? mm. Everyone's like <laughs> by Jesus. definition, almost Every, by definition all, all in their mind. You know, like by definition in their mind, a religious leader must be a peaceful person. You know, um, and you say, well, try looking at the text. You know, well, they're not interested. You know, they don't want to know. Yeah, and 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 I think that the part of the re the retinence why the liberal establishment can't or won't join up the dots is because in their mind, they can't make a distinguishment between Islam and Muslim. And so when when me and you throughout this entire conversation have been talking about Islam, Islam, we prefixed it by stating this is not about what individual or groups of Muslims do. This is about what yeah. texts teach. Yeah. But I guarantee that there'll be lots of Muslim, sorry, lots of liberals who watch this, who every time we said Islam, yeah. they heard the word Muslim. And and so this is part of the reason why um, our elites can't deal with this is because there's lots of good Muslims out there who don't tap into this anti-Semitic narrative. Yeah, no, absolutely. And they would are. be just as yes. horrified of, of anti-Semitism as, as me yes, and you would. Yes, and my motive, part of my motive is to explain to them exactly what Islam is like and to show them what they're following, you know, and get them to look at the texts, which, of course, are now readily available on the Internet for anyone to go and check for themselves. Um, which is, you know, causing many Muslims to revisit their religion and 
and think about it, particularly if they've been Western educated and therefore taught by Western education to question things, to investigate things, to, you know, and then they they can go and look up then the Quran and the Hadith as well are readily available, easily, easily accessible on the internet. And you can go and check it out for yourselves. And then they're asking difficult questions and quite often leaving Islam as a result. You know, well, the other, the other, the other problem for us is uh, the other problem for the West is that, as you showed from Palestine, bearing in mind that the Scottish government wants to import huge numbers of Gazans into the UK, is that if seventy three percent, if seventy odd percent of of Gazans support Hamas with Hamas's apocalyptic uh, vision of a future war between Muslims and Jews, um, and yeah. and and the virulent anti semitism that Hamas has taught, then that means we're going to let of, of let let's just imagine that the numbers hold consistent. That seventy percent of all the people that we bring over from Gaza are going to be rabid anti-Semites. They're going yes. to 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 be buying into anti-Semitism to some degree, um, and study after study. But is worse shown. than that, you know, even but worse than that as well, because Hamas is now a prescribed terrorist organization as well, isn't it? You know, so it's 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 you know, if they support Hamas, they are supporting a terrorist organization and sympathizing with terrorism. Right? So we're so importing them. You're importing people who are open to supporting or, you know, and in some cases carrying out terrorist acts. And and the other, the other point... That Why did it take so long to prescribe Hamas as a terrorist organization? I mean, that's crazy. It's, it? a, it's a great question. It is a great question. You've got I, their charter right there in front of you. You can go and Google it. Just read it for yourself. It's obvious. It's staring you in the face. Yeah, it's because it's cause the liberal... I, I the, the honest reason, I think, is because liberals just... They, they, they're so filled with their own virtue signaling and so filled with their own worldview they they'd have no time to do any actual research of any deep or profound questions one one of the points that seems to have escaped public debate on this question is that if you are willing to tolerate muslims here supporting terrorism over there mm. how long will it be before those same muslims support terrorism here oh yeah no i mean yes uh, it's it's extraordinary how many you know we've had plenty of terrorist attacks here and of course the most recent one is it right? The most recent one was probably the killing of Sir David Amos, MP, you know, assassination of an MP by a Muslim. But we've had dozens of foiled terrorist attacks, which don't obviously make the news in anything like the same way. Mm. Had even a fraction of them succeeded, I wonder if our attitudes would be very different towards immigration and Islam and so on in this country. I, I think that most people in the i think an increasing number of people in the general public have woken up but we can't underestimate the power of the media yeah. to shepherd people's minds and thoughts yeah. like again a terrorist attack after terrorist attack after terrorist attack we the media induces a come by our response yeah. you know let yeah. let's not look back in anger that this our not, children have just been Islam, blown up this is distortion of islam all this yeah stuff. And and so, yeah. I, the, like the 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 biggest problem that we face is the sheer power of the media in covering up people's minds yeah. with a falsehood, basically. Yeah, it's Ten... quite interesting. There's a government report that came out today or very recently um, on um, on things that affect democracy, and Islamism is one of those things. And it's and Islamism is defined as having been invented in the 20th century. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so only in the 20th century have people actually believe the Quran and take them and take yeah, the religion. Like the, 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 fact that, the fact that the Muslims of of Muslim armies have marched for 1400 years straight without us missing a single year into yeah. a, some Christian village or some Christian city or town or country somewhere, crying out Allah Akbar whilst enslaving women and children and burning down and destroying churches. Obviously, uh, you know they they must have misunderstood. Um, the Quran's injunctions, all of those Muslims for 1400 years, you know. Anyway, it's been beautiful talking to you, Tim. Um, hold on, because I know we're going to have a chat after the live stream's finished. Um, it's not a live stream, it's a recording after the recording's finished. So I'm just going to close us in another prayer in a psalm, um, and then I'll end the recording and, and we'll have a catch up. Okay, so this is from Psalm 92. It is good to give thanks to Yahweh, to sing praises to your name, 
Most High, to declare your faithful love in the morning and your faithfulness at night with a ten-stringed harp and the music of a lyre. For you have made me rejoice, Yahweh, by what you have done. I will shout for joy because of the works of your hands. How magnificent are the works of your hands, Yahweh. How profound your thoughts. A stupid person does not know. A fool does not understand this. Though the wicked sprout like grass and all evildoers flourish, they will eternally be destroyed. For you, Yahweh, are exalted forever. For indeed, Yahweh, your enemies, indeed, your enemies will perish. All evildoers will be scattered. You have lifted up my horn like that of a wild ox. I have been anointed with the finest oil. My eyes look at my enemies when evildoers rise against me. My ears hear them. The righteous thrive like a palm tree and grow like a cedar tree in Lebanon, planted in the house of Yahweh. They thrive in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age, healthy and green, to declare Yahweh is just. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Okay, I'll just end the recording. Thank you again.